She's doing a whole series on how to teach writing, and this is the third in the series called Revising Revisions. And we all know that kids hate it when you tell them they have to redo their work, but um, you know, when you follow Steve's techniques, I think uh, they, they may find it fun. And I do want to let you know we have two sessions coming up next week. On March 14th, we have Yong Zhao, who studies world-class learning. Uh, he's written a lot uh, and, actually, and talked a lot about comparing the educational systems of China and the US. And he's going to be talking about um, how we instill a spirit of entrepreneurship and inquiry into students. And then on March 17th, we're going to have uh, two guests from England, from the UK, Alex Bell and Sylvan Baker. And they're going to be talking about something called immersive democracy, which is a term I'd never heard of before. But it comes from the performing arts. And it's a way of giving voice to all um, all individuals within a particular system. And they've been applying this to education to improve the improve student learning and teacher satisfaction so that should, should that should prove to be very interesting and then uh, without further ado uh, let me bring on Steve uh, I, this is the third of four sessions that Steve is doing this one is on revising revisions and then the final one in this series will be on um, on nonfiction, and actually, it's titled wrong because it's not write nonfiction now. It's not. It should be write nonfiction on April thirteenth because uh, that's that's when the session is. But let me uh, let me bring this down. Let me bring Steve up. Hi there. Hey. hey. So welcome back. Thank you very much. So um, yeah. So you voted. Where are you again? I you're. In, Oh, I'm in, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Okay. So then it was early voting because isn't your primary... Yes, we early Tuesday? voted today. That's right. Oh, we well, well I'm, glad, I'm glad you did your civic duty. Took a high school senior to the polls, registered, and she voted for the first time. Wow. Wow. Democracy, democracy in action. Mm -hmm. So I got your newsletter today, and just one of the things that struck me, what do you have against poor old William Faulkner? I got nothing against William Faulkner. I, he's oh, okay. great. Yeah, oh, okay. No, I, was he's... Just, I was just saying that I enjoyed, I uh, I, I enjoyed um, John Green's book more than I did The Sound and the Fury. <laughs> well, it takes it takes it takes a lot of uh, effort to read uh, to read Sound and the Fury. Yes. Whereas whereas uh, Green's books, you can you can kind of read in a couple days and. That's what I. And, that's and what I'm after. Right. <laughs> so why don't I pull your slides up and I'll pull okay, myself great. down. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Hey, everybody. It's nice to see you tonight. Um, I am working on a different monitor. So if, I, um, if you see me looking down, um, it's just that my camera is way up high. Hopefully, I'm looking you in the eye right now, but I can't actually see my slides. So apologies if I appear not to be looking straight at you. Um, I'm really serious about the title here. Uh, it's called Revising Revision, and I want to revise uh, how it is we think about helping kids do it. Um, Mitch is right. It's not something kids like to do. And guess what? It's not something adults like to do either. Um, my wife's a professional writer. I'm a professional writer. Nobody likes to revise, really. Um, but many of us recognize a couple of things. One, it's absolutely necessary. And two, in a teaching environment, uh, revision is the only time when kids really learn to write. Uh, and I'll talk about that as we get a little farther into the, to the workshop. But revision is the most important thing we can have kids do. So we absolutely have to make sure they're doing it most of the time. And that's what tonight's about. All right? So anytime anybody wants to talk to me, pop something in. Uh, the IM window or do anything you want and I'll answer any question. All right, so here we are, revision. I usually just tell kids a very simple revision. My whole goal, the very first day I want kids to revise, which I hope is the very first day I'm with them, is, is to show them uh, the easiest way possible to get everybody to have committed an act of revision. So I just say revision is changing text to make it better. That's all, that's all I talk about. All right, next. All right, so here's the key thing. Revision is a behavior that anyone can exhibit. We've, we've for a long time, and, and I, I was this way too, I, I, I went along this way of thinking. 
Revising is hard. It takes a lot of skill. I haven't taught all these skills, so I can't ask kids to revise, so they can't learn the skills. And there's kind of a catch-22 there, and I needed to wriggle out of it. And, and the way I've done that with a lot of things is simply to treat revision as a behavior that's independent of skill. That is to say, anybody can revise. Um, they may not revise well, they may not revise fast, but anybody can exhibit the behavior of revision, which is attempting to make a text better by changing it. Next slide. Okay, so this is the big thing. Revision is where writers learn to write. Um, this is just demonstrably true. Um, if I'm a writer and I want to get better than I am now, the only way to do that is to look at how I write something now, think about writing it differently, write it differently, compare the two, and figure out that I've written something better. That is to say, the only way I can become a better writer is to produce better writing through revision. And one of the things that you may have come across in your life um, is that most of us don't get better at writing. Um, I, even, as, even after 10 years of writing professionally, I stumbled across some old papers from college. I picked them up, I read them, and I thought, wow, these are pretty good. I wonder who wrote these. And I had written them 10 or 12 years before in college. Truth is, I hadn't, I hadn't improved a bit between age 22 and age 34. Um, but when I started working with kids in classrooms and I had to figure out how to explain what writing was, I really had to relearn it and look at my own writing again. And sure enough, the only way I've gotten any better at all over the years is to, revi is to have revised a lot. Um, and I think you see this in kids who um, get to about second grade, they can write a lot of words, and uh, third grade or so, and then they really, the writing, quality of the writing doesn't really get any better uh, as they get older. Uh, they just get bigger, and they write longer, and they have more stamina, and their vocabulary grows a little bit, but they don't really know very much about quality, and the main reason is, is they, they rarely spend time in revision. So we're going to solve, that's the problem to solve. How do we get kids to spend more time in revision? Because it's the key to building better writers. All right, here we go. So I've already said that revision is a behavior, then that anybody can do it, and, uh, and that it's not skill dependent. So the next thing I have to do for kids is just tell them five different ways to, to revise so that they can tell me when they're doing it. Revision is adding something new. It's deleting something you've got you don't like. It's changing something into something else. It's moving something around. And there's a fifth one that's kind of sophisticated, but I think it's really important. It's called keeping. It's when I look at something in my writing, and I think it's not good enough. And I play with it a little bit, or I look at it a little more, and eventually I decide to keep it. If you've ever seen uh, an editor's mark, uh, S-T-E-T, -E I just call it STET. Um, that means leave as it was written. Don't essentially follow the edit. Um, some people say it stands for some turkey edited this. Um, but keeping, having the presence of mind to keep something when you thought it was needed to be better is probably the most sophisticated revision we can make. It's a non-revision. But I want to tell kids, hey, there's, there's yet another way that you can get on the board here and be revising. But you don't have to convince me that it's worth it. So uh, we're going to start here with just the quickest little activity. This is how I start the year with kids and what I can do in like 10 or 15 minutes. And it's what you, I, if, if you have a pen and a piece of paper, just do this right along with me. Um, this is just an accident I had. So think of some funny, not too serious, falling down, skinning your knee kind of accident, okay? And draw a stick figure like picture that is the rough equivalent of mine. Um, this is just me taking my two dogs uh, down the stairs and out for their, for their last uh, time out for the night. Okay, so this is that's a strategy I use called draw label caption. This is the draw part. Mitch, if you'll flip the next one. The next thing to do is to label everything. Um, again, really easy. Everybody can participate. Not much ability level stuff to it. Kindergartners can get on the board with, with invented spelling. And uh, I've got a bunch of words now. And each of these things is something I can I can write something about. But I do want the kids to, um, to write down at least a sentence describing what this catastrophe is all about. 
So if this is the caption part, uh, I fell down the stairs taking our dogs outside. So this is actually my handwriting and my work, and, and you can see it's probably second grade quality maybe. I don't know. There's some first graders who probably have better handwriting. Anyway, that's what I've got. That's my whole piece. I fell down the stairs taking our dogs outside. Now, if we want kids to revise more, we have to give them more chances to revise. And the key to that is working on shorter pieces and, and directing them explicitly to make smaller revisions. So I'm going to take you through about six or eight revisions that I made to this one sentence. You will also get this in a packet. If you were on the list, you got it today, but I'll send it out again uh, next week. Uh, it'll be in, a, in the form of an excerpt from uh, a new book I have coming out, which um, kind of looks like this. Um, it's called Be a Better Writer, and it'll be out very soon. And I'll show you, this is from the book, and I'll, I'll send you this excerpt that you can use in your classes if you like. So um, let's go to the next screen. So the first thing I'm looking at is, is, a, is a directed thing, and, and I would direct you to try the same thing, as I'm going to say, let's try to change and make one little thing more specific. OK, I, I had I fell down the stairs and that's kind of a weak, unspecific verb. So I'm going to put in I'm going to change fell to tumbled because tumbled is a strong verb. And if you ever tried to explain strong verbs to kids, there's a real easy way to do it. A strong verb is a generic verb that has the sense of an adverb packed into it. So tumbling is a kind of falling and Therefore, it has the verb fall and the adverb, which is probably like head over heels or something like that. That's the sense of tumbling that we get. And that's what makes it a strong verb, and that's what makes it more specific. So um, I tumbled down the stairs taking our dogs outside. Make literally one revision. This was a change revision. Change one word or two words. That's it. That's the first revision task. Here's the second one. I'm trying again to be more specific. And I thought, well, I can at least tell you who our dogs are. So uh, now my sentence read, I tumbled, reads, I tumbled down the stairs taking our dogs, Mookie and Marvin, outside. So I haven't really done too much. But if you would, add just a tiny little detail that tells us a little more about anything in your sentence. So again, all I'm really doing is reinforcing the behavior. You've all now, hopefully, done one sentence, one change revision, and one add revision. And we've only gotten five minutes in, and I can basically say to, to kids of any age, hey, I just caught you revising. Uh, we're just going to keep doing it, OK? So let's go to the next slide and see what my next revision is here, see what I'm doing with this. Aha. Um, I wanted to be a little more specific about what I'm taking the dogs out for. Um, they like to go out in the backyard at night. Of course, we, we hope that they, uh, we, uh, they uh, go to the bathroom outside. Uh, usually, they just play around in the back, and I have to go take the flashlight out and get them. It's almost like uh, they're on some kind of adventure. And um, our dogs will only come in for organic vegetables. So I usually take some collard greens or something out with me. Uh, they love tofu, um, you know, to get them back inside. And so um, as I took our dogs, Mookie and Marvin, outside for their last adventure of the night, I tumbled down the stairs. My sentence is getting a little bit better. Um, it's not going to win a Pulitzer Prize, but I've made another add-on revision. All right? And hopefully you've done the same. One, two, four words, doesn't matter. Now I'm getting to a point where I have to actually add enough information to tell you what is going on. I told you originally that I had some kind of accident, but up until now, there's been no talk of really what that accident was except me tumbling down the stairs. And for all you know, I'm a great gymnast and I tumble down the stairs regularly. Um, so I want to be more uh, clear about this, so I'm going to add essentially an exclamation and a, a sentence after that to be more specific. Always when we're revising, I think what we're trying to do is be clearer. That's what I tell the kids. So a kid will make a revision just to make one, and I'll say, tell me why that makes it clearer. 
Are you telling me something I don't know? Are you making something less confusing? Um, so now I've got, as I took our dogs, Mookie and Marvin, outside for their last adventure of the night, I tumbled down the stairs. Crack! I heard the crunch of breaking bones as the dog, excited as always, ran between my legs. Now I see that I've got a really embarrassing problem. Did the dogs break their bones? Did I break my bones? Did, did I break their legs when they ran between my legs? Or what happened? This is actually now completely confusing. Um, I, I, think, I think we could intuit that somehow the dogs tripped me or I was tripped when the dogs ran by. But it's clearly not uh, specific enough uh, in the sentence as it is. So I've got to add or do something here. Um, Mitch, throw up another one. Let's see what I did. OK, here we go. I'm adding a new part on. Crack. I heard the crunch of breaking bones as I tripped on a step, trying to avoid stepping on the dog as they ran between my legs. Well, that's better, but it's oddly still not specific enough. Um, crunch of breaking bones. It's like, what bones have I broken? Again, are they mine? Are they the dog's? Are they somebody else's? Um, Hopefully, you're adding a little something to your sentence too each time. Maybe you're crossing a word out. Maybe you're doing a deletion. You're doing a change. Each time you do one of these, you're doing a revision. I've done four or five so far. Let's do another one, Mitch. OK, here we go. Finally, in the purple, I have added the exact right thing. So now look at it. Crack, I heard the crunch of breaking bones on the outer side of my right foot as I tripped on a step, losing my balance as the dogs raced between my legs. Now you can start to see that my, my scene is coming together here in a way that, that, that you can get a, a better sense for what happened. Um, uh, I was taking the dogs out. They got a little excited. Um, still don't remember exactly what happened, but they ran by me. I tripped on the stairs and um, uh, crunched the bones on the outer side of my right foot. Uh, sometimes I tell kids about too much detail or details that aren't important. And, and a, really, a really good example is, is that I had a fracture of my fifth metatarsal. Um, but that is absolutely not a detail that anyone needs to know. So I'm not going to put that in in a parenthetical, say, on the outer side of my right foot, as I tripped on the step, diagnosis, broken fifth metatarsal. You know, that's a detail that we just don't need. Um, so uh, sometimes the details we have are not the right details. And that's what I want to get across to kids. So if a kid puts a detail in that just seems gratuitous because he's trying to say he did a revision every time and it's not a very useful detail I'll say well you better perform another revision and take it out so he gets mad but he deletes it and I said good job you did another revision um, so hopefully you're getting the idea I've got the kids kind of moving along now they're used to the idea of revision in fact at this point we've spent twice as long revising as we did writing let's flip it again because I've still got a problem or two to solve here all right, now, I was really trying to think here of how I could not only be clearer, but also, so what would be the better lead? I think ultimately, I had buried the lead here. I had put the, the, the interesting part, the crack and the breaking of the bones, in the middle of the paragraph when I should have put it up at the top. And this is a very, very common thing to do. This is a moving around revision, right? I moved the second sentence up to be the first, basically. Crack, I heard the crunch of breaking bones on the outer side of my right foot as I tripped on a step, lost my balance, and tumbled down the stairs to avoid our dogs, Mookie and Marvin, as they raced between my legs on their way out for their last adventure of the night. Finally, I think I have something that makes sense. And I think it's in the right order, which is to say, not necessarily the order in which it happened, but the best order to present it to my audience. There is only one problem, and that is, is that this sentence is horrifically long. Let me count the words here. I'm going to count crack as part of the sentence. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 40, 1, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 50. Ah, 53 words. That's ridiculous. 
Um, it's ridiculous for a lot of reasons, um, but it's just ridiculous. So let's see what I can do. I think my goal now is going to be actually trying to split it up into shorter sentences. Let's see if I was able to do that with the next revision. Huh. Okay, I think I did. I, th I added this, this gray part is new stuff that I've added in order to get this down to like four sentences. I think that's better. So let's, let's see if I've got the right thing now. Crack, I heard the crunch of breaking bones on the outer side of my right foot. I think that's a good opening sentence. Our dogs, Mookie and Marvin, race between my legs on their way out for their last adventure of the night. Okay, not bad. I tried not to step on them and stepped on myself instead. That is exactly what happened. I tripped, lost my balance, and tumbled down the stairs, landing on the landing, my right foot, my foot throbbing with pain. All right, now I've got something that I think is a little more manageable. I could probably knock that last longer sentence into two, but I've got to four sentences now, and I've got a reasonably good paragraph. It could still be fixed, it could still be improved, but, but more than anything, hopefully, uh, you're all with me. And I think I just went through, let's look at how many colors. I got one orange, purple, three red, pink, blue, four, five, yellow, green, six, gray, seven, red, eight, black, nine. Yeah, okay, I've got nine or 10 colors here, which means I did that many minus one revisions. Um, so if we were to have just gone through this last 10 or 15 minutes together as a class, I would have said, okay, let's just stop right now and share what we've got and look at how far we went. And I, what I want to let you know is we just spent some time really writing. We really did what real writers do. We looked at our writing again and again and again. We asked, how can I make it better? And we changed things each time. So even if you didn't change something every time I did, even if you didn't follow the direction for the specific revision that I executed, maybe you did half of them. I did it eight or nine times. Maybe you did it four or five times. It doesn't matter. You have just entered the realm of revision. Uh, uh, and, and you will never come back from that. For the rest of the year that I'm teaching you, you will perpetually be revising like this. And the reason that's important is because I want kids to revise their whole feeling about revision. Revision is not something you do only once in a while. Revision is not a big deal. Revision is not something that gets graded. Revision is not something that takes a long time. It's not even hard. It'll get harder, but it's not hard right now. And it's not something that only really good writers can do. Hopefully, I've revised everybody's attitude in the first 15 or 20 minutes. And I'll tell kids, tomorrow, guess what we're going to do? We're going to do some writing and a lot of revision. Guess what we're going to do? Writing and a lot of revision. And as I sort of, I sort of plan out a, a week or a two week on a short piece, um, I'm really looking at having a half to you know, 40%, 35 to 40%, 50% of the time spent on revision. And if the kids know that and they come to expect it, and I always make it doable for them, there's really no reason for them not to do it, especially when they can see themselves getting better and I can give them praise that's directly connected not to their results, but to their effort. All right, so this is generally called write small, revise big. And if I were starting the year, um, I would probably do four or five of these one or two paragraph pieces as quickly as I could get the kids to do them. I'd like them to take them through editing and copy them out or print them out and format them so that by the time we were done with a week or two of class, every kid might have three or four of these sitting in a little folder or on a hard drive. And what we'd all have is a good starting point. I'd know a lot about the kids. They'd know a lot about me. We'd have all our procedures figured out. Everybody would know the drill. And one thing we would have proven is that we can all revise. OK, let's go to the next one. So here's the question. We usually have a little question for you to talk for a few minutes. And you can come over and talk with me. The question is, what would happen if for the next 10 to 15 writing sessions you had with your kids, that's starting tomorrow or Monday, 10 to 15 sessions, or if you want to put it off till next year, the first 10 to 15 sessions of next year, you focused on writing very short pieces based on student-selected topics 
with most of the time spent on small revisions. What would happen if you did that? That's the question. Give it some thought, ping me in the IM window or come on over and see me. And Mitch, let's talk about it for a couple of minutes. So uh, before I bring Steve back up, um, I'm kind of proud of myself because uh, while I was running uh, the, the slides for Steve, I also worked a little bit on the, uh, on the exercise that, that he asked us to do. And um, you know, I was following along and, and, and for me it worked really well and I think it could work well, it could work really well for kids also. I started off with, um, I fell down skiing and broke my hand and then I used a more uh, powerful verb with I slipped and then um, a little bit more description uh, with, with about how I fell on my pole and through this process of let's see one two three four five six through seven revisions um, I finally got to the point where uh, you know it's not going to win a Pulitzer Prize uh, but um, but it's kind of an interesting sentence. I, I was enjoying skiing and decided to take one last run, even though it was late in the day. It was an easy run on a green trail. Bam! My skis stopped on a hidden rock, and I tumbled and broke my hand when I fell on my pole. Ouch! I couldn't even bend my fingers or hold my ski pole. There went the day, the week, and the entire ski season. So um, I don't know if I'll ever use that, but it certainly is a lot better than what I started off with, which is I fell down skiing and broke my pole, or bro broke my hand. So um, let me pull Steve up, and he can tell me how I did. Mitch okay, did, Steve. did fantastically well. Wow. Now, here's, here's, here's what I liked about what you did that I was not able to do. You actually completed a piece. Um, somehow you put a little backstory into it. You put, you set up the scene, and then we know you're wiped out for the season. So you clearly got to the end. It's over. It's over. It was done. <laughs> it's over. And, and I'm really, really happy. Um, one of the first, the first two lessons that I, I generally teach kids that are formal revision lessons are how to write a good beginning and how to write a good ending. All I really need is a few sentences for the middle. And if I can get them in with a sentence and get them out with a sentence, we can have these tiny little finished pieces. And mm -hmm. what I want to tell kids is that in the last 15 or 20 years, uh, an, entirely, an entire set of new micro genres has uh, appeared. Um, you may be aware of the famous 55 fiction contest mm -hmm. and the, the wonderful book, The World's Shortest Stories. That's a wonderful thing, stories of 55 words. There's something now called a drabble, which is supposed to be 100 words. Um, there are six word memoirs from a famous Hemingway boast and bet. Hemingway bet that he could write, but bet a bunch of drunk people that he could write an entire novel in six words. This is a little morose, but it's clever. Uh, everybody <laughs> took him up on the bet. He got everybody drunk, and then they made him confess up. And he said, OK, here's my story. Um, let's see if I can remember this. Baby shoes, oh, for sale, baby shoes never worn. <laughs> Six words wow. tells a whole story. So I, I do, for kids, I go like this, for sale, prom dress, never worn. And it, it, it is a great story. It is a complete story in six words. There are seven sentence stories that I've seen some people do. There are all kinds of things. And of course, you're free to make up your own forms if you like. Um, and what I want to do is I want to point out to kids that um, the, the, the point of all of this is to offer the reader a complete experience. There's a there's a there's a secondary factor here is this I don't want kids to write haiku anymore I'm just I'm just personally tired of haiku um, and so uh, this is my way of telling them there's lots of short things to write and um, all your longer pieces are just lots of short things put put together so they Mitch, can even reach awesome. they can even reach a billion people with 140 characters right. That's right. So we do talk about Twitter. We talk about uh, tweets and Facebook status posts and all kinds of things that, that are coming in now uh, as legitimate small forms. Um, so let me get your, I'm going to get let your, get your slides back up. Okay. But OK. <laughs> all right, here we go for the second half. I'm going to show you the what I call the high value revision. So 
Now, let's imagine we're into the second or third week of school, and we've had a lot of success and a lot of fun. Um, what I've gotten from kids are probably three or four or five pieces. Maybe one or two of them has reached a finished state to some degree. But what I've got now is a big, huge mess of pieces. And they take five seconds to whip through. And I can quickly tell him almost instantly the list of lessons I need to teach for the next six to eight weeks or months. Um, but I always have uh, four or five high value ones that I teach every group of kids. And I usually say, look, kids, if all you feel like learning are these five things, um, I, you'll be a great writer if you learn them well. So if that's all you take out of the class, you're a winner. And you'll do some great writing, and you'll be very successful. OK, so the first thing I teach kids to do is how to revise beginnings. It's very, very easy. It turns out that there are just dozens of ways of starting a story. I chose one of the easier ones in mine. I chose to start mine with a sound crack. Um, I have, uh, you'll see some things on the next page, but I have a document that I'll put up for uh, a link to uh, when I send you my uh, follow-up email. I think it has 32 different beginnings in it. And I just teach kids different ones. We try two or three for each piece, and we see how it goes until we get one we like. Again, sometimes the beginning is buried down underneath some other things, and we just have buried the lead, and I unbury it, and we've got a new lead. So let's go to the next page. Okay, here's eight. Oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, um, sorry about all the X's. We had a little file transfer issue, I think. Um, nonetheless, there are eight kinds of beginnings here. A question beginning. What would happen if you ate every meal at McDonald's for a month? A dialogue beginning. What do you mean we're not going to Disney World? My sister screamed. A description beginning. Dust, dirt were everywhere. Cobwebs clung to the corners. But it was home for now. Action. He raced down the stairs, slid out the door, hopped on his bike, and hit the road. Um, these are just this eight really easy kinds of beginnings. Kids love the list one because it feels like poetry. Sore muscles, mosquito bites, no video games. That's what camping means to me. Um, so I just teach them these little types of beginnings. They try them. Now I say, try, find one that works with your piece. Um, very easy to do. All the kids really have to do is come up with a new starting sentence for their piece. And then I can celebrate their mastery of having revised beginnings. Once we've done it a few times, I just make a rule. Everybody's got to come up with at least three different leads for every piece they write. Um, most really good writers come up with 10 or 20. Um, so um, three is not hard at all. So let's go to the next one. Big value in revising beginnings. As I said, I've got to get you out of a piece so that you can complete a piece. The, the whole goal in this business of teaching kids to write is to actually teach them to write. And at every stage of the writing process, there are things they have to learn. So the kids who learn the most are the ones who go through the writing process the most. So how do you maximize the number of times a kid can iterate through the writing process? Their pieces have to be short. So I've got to teach them how to quickly get in, say what they got to say, and quickly get out. So I teach them endings exactly the same way as I teach them the beginning. And um, I also point out that, that if, they, if they have a uh, beginning that they didn't use or they have an ending that they didn't use, that every paragraph of every piece is a beginning to something and an end to something. And what we end up doing is reusing that material later in the piece. So uh, it's, it's very high value. Go to the next screen. We'll see some, some uh, endings here. Uh, a question ending. It's a question beginning and a question ending. Why didn't I think it through more carefully? When will I ever learn my lesson? Um, description. I always like this one. Dead quiet. Nobody said a word. We just listened to the sound of the rain and wondered. Um, uh, feelings always works. I know I can trick a kid into coming and ending with a piece of paper. Just say to them, how did you feel when that was all over? Whatever they say, for some reason, makes a perfect ending. It must be some sort of human thing. But feelings. He was laughing so hard, I thought he'd fall over, and everyone else was laughing too. That just sounds like the ending to something. And then, of course, there's the moral of the story or the lesson. Uh, the guy who said slow and steady makes the grade uh, probably wasn't working on deadline. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it's slow and steady wins the race. I often get that uh, one confused. Uh, oftentimes, too, in persuasive writing, we have a call to action. So I just call that a do ending. So I'll say something like, take a few minutes at the end of each day and think of all the good things in your life. These are somewhat cliche, 
but they're easy for kids to, to mimic. Um, and they'll slowly build up a vocabulary of beginnings because we'll have a lot of different ones in the class. We'll put them up somewhere on a sheet. We'll put a big sheet up of endings. And then everybody can just borrow everybody else's beginnings and endings. Now, they're not copying the words. They're just mimicking the type and using their own content. But pretty soon, you know, if I take a, if I take a week on beginnings and a week on endings, and we've already spent two or three weeks writing a middle, I know that I can walk in on the sixth week of school and say, OK, heads down, pick a topic, go, f need a finished piece in 45 minutes. And I'll probably get them in 20. And if I can get effectively what is a first draft of a short piece in 20 minutes, you know what I can do? Then I can reliably assign drafting as homework. That is nirvana for me as a writing teacher. I assign all topic selection and drafting as homework. Why? Because it leaves all of class time for revision and editing, and then I assign final publishing as homework. So the two things that kids need most, revising and editing for uh, conventions, uh, are the two things that we spend the most time on. Why? Because I give them enough tools to do the other things effectively by themselves at home. That's, that's the whole trick that I'm trying to, to, to perpetuate here. That's when I'm in week seven, week eight, week nine, and I know I've got it working right uh, because I can count on the kids to come in the next day with stuff ready to be worked on. All right, let's go to the next uh, important revision. So um, the third revision that I teach is revising for a main idea. This one takes a little longer because most kids are pretty confused about what a main idea is. Um, I don't really care what they know about or don't know about it. I just start them all over again with a definition that, that has worked very well for me. Uh, the main idea is the focus of the piece. If, if, if kids are wont to uh, run off topic or whatever, it just means they don't have a main idea. So revising idea for, for main idea means knowing what the main idea is and making sure that everything else in the piece supports it. So I usually say that the main idea is the one most important thing you want your readers to know. So um, say going back to my dog piece, um, uh, oh, I found out a funny thing when I went to get my boot from my broken foot. The woman immediately said, pet, pet accident? And I said, how did you know? She said, over 50% of the people who come in here with, bro with minor you know, breaks and fractures of uh, extremities are related to injuries with pets. And, and I thought, wow, that would be a fascinating article to write. So my main idea would probably be how easy it is to injure yourself if you have pets. Um, and, and that's everything. That's what I would write about. So the other thing I point out to kids is it's really hard to be successful without a clear main idea. If I have those kids who just want to get their work done and get out of town, then I, I tell them, kids, the main idea is your savior. The faster you get a main idea, the faster you get the details done, get finished, and you'll get done with your piece. All right, let's, let's flip the switch there. So here's some information on main idea. And again, I'm sorry for all these little X's. I will make sure you get this entire packet in PDF, uh, ship shape and Bristol fashion, I believe is the term. In any case, the main idea is the one most important thing you want your reader to know. There's no such thing as main ideas, just like there's no such thing as water mains really. Main means one, and that's the key to helping kids uh, get some focus. If you could boil a piece down to a single sentence that represented what it was all about, that would be your main idea. So your main idea has to meet these criteria. It has to be a complete sentence. It has to be important to the writer. It has to be a message, a moral, or a lesson. And it has to be important to the reader. We usually have to guess about that. But again, after those first three weeks, we've shared so much writing, we kind of know what everybody likes. So we have a hint of that. And then I have this little acrostic joke at the bottom. Don't omit the one most important thing. And that's really the little nugget I want them to take away. Don't leave out the one most important thing. You'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't, how many times kids write, and the, and the antidote to every problem they have is simply getting them to choose one sentence that their piece is about. Because as soon as they have that sentence, they can run through their piece and slash out everything that doesn't go with that sentence and circle everything that does, recopy the piece, and be almost finished. So um, main idea is huge, and it is hugely effective. And without it, you can't really succeed. So don't omit, don't omit the one most important thing. 
Okay, Mint, let's go to the next one. All right, revising for details. Details, um, I probably have 20 revision lessons or 30 lessons on details because details are so varied and so important. But at the moment, I only want to do, I only want to accomplish two things. I want, well, three things. I want kids, one, to know that really uh, everything readers are looking for is in the details. Um, so the details are the high value stuff for the reader. The second thing I want them to know is what a detail is. Uh, we went over this uh, last month, um, but it's worth going over again. We need a, an explicit definition for a detail. So what's a detail? It's the answer to a question a reader might have. The answer to a question a reader might have. And that tells me the third thing. How do I get details? I, I share my piece and have people ask questions. If they ask good questions, that is questions that are germane or relevant to my main idea, I answer them and I add them into my piece. So one of the rules I make early on when kids are drafting, and they'll often learn it themselves, they'll come up and say, I'm drafting. So and the rule is questions only during drafting. So a kid will come up, say he's drafting, he'll read his piece. Bing, 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 four or five questions. Bing, 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 four or five answers. The kid goes back and writes three or four paragraphs. This can happen in about a minute and a half once you get it working. It's also a model for a quick conference. I can have a 30 second or 45 second conference by literally going to a kid's desk, peeking over their shoulder, reading any part of their story and asking them a question about it. As long as I can get them to voice the answer and say, write that down, I can leave their desk and go to see someone else. And that's how I can get around to see kids, um, you know, many, many times during the writing process, especially if most of the time we're in revision, they're mostly working. I'm not teaching lessons. I'm going around one-to-one -one or in small groups, helping them with very specific things. We have so many strategies for details that no kid should ever have to worry about it. Kids are always worried about details. I know because I was one, I was always worried about them. I always got dinged for not having enough details. But the truth of the matter is, is there are so many ways to put them in that no kid should ever have to worry about it. It's up to us to teach one, two, three, four, five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 ways to put details in. And I'll give you lots of those uh, when you get your documents after this workshop is over. Let's flip the next slide, Mitch. Okay, so here's one way of revising for details. Um, uh, again, this is about the question. So on the one side of a T-chart, what you've written. On the other side, questions the reader might have. Answer the questions, put them in your piece. You got it. Let's go for another detail mini lesson. You can, okay, here we go. Use the idea detail strategy. So I've got a strategy where I put the idea on the left side and on the, on the right side, I just have kids think about extra information they could attach, but they don't have to worry about writing it in order, really. They just have to jot this stuff down. I write these examples in complete sentences, but the kids never do. They just make lists, bullet lists. And when I'm in class, I usually make bullet lists, too. So our second detail revising strategy is called the idea details strategy. And let's have the next one. Let's see what we've got. Aha, tell show. This is nice for descriptive writing. So I usually tell kids to work with a feeling. There's always an emotion in everything uh, that was going on. In Mitch's piece, there was probably some excitement and then some pain and then probably a, a real kind of resignation when he realized he was out for the season. And, and what I usually tell kids is I say for every human emotion, there's a set of physical uh, things we can describe that would show somebody that we're having that emotion. So in this one, the tell is I was scared. The show is I froze on the spot. I felt my heart race and my breathing quickened, but I couldn't move. I tried to yell for help, but nothing came out. Clearly, that's a person who was scared. And that's really good descriptive writing. And this solves the show don't tell problem with an explicit strategy. So I don't ever have to yell at kids, show don't tell. I don't ever have to write that on a piece of paper. I just have, I just, why don't you use the tell show strategy right there? Some kid says the movie was great. I say, use the tell show on that. Uh, some kid says, uh, uh, my new clothes, my new school clothes are terrible. I say, tell show on that. The, my third period teacher is mean, tell show on that. Um, my favorite food is pepperoni pizza. Give me a tell show on that. Show me you eating your favorite food. Um, tell show is so great and so easy um, that 
it solves two huge problems. One, it solves the problem for the teacher of descriptive detail. Two, it solves a huge problem with the kid. And I felt this really all my life in school. I felt that I was literally a failed writer because I could not write with the descriptive detail that English teachers love. And, and you know, I didn't really care about writing, but I did care about, like, human beings and I didn't want to keep disappointing my English teachers and they really didn't want to keep being disappointed by me and so I really did want to be able to write descriptively I really did want to show and not tell but I never knew how to do it and I never got a strategy so when I had to teach it I thought I'm not going to do that to kids I'm just going to give them an easy way to do it and once kids learn this tell show they just go to town so already we've got three detail revising strategies did I put a fourth one in there Mitch I did indeed. Okay, so um, one interesting thing to do is to realize that that writers add details in different categories. And if you've ever told kids to use the five senses for details, that's fine. Um, the downside of that is that uh, the five senses uh, are not distributed equally in writing. Uh, visual details are about 90%. You get a little bit of smelling, a little bit of hearing, and uh, a little bit of the others, but almost everything is sight. Um, but the, some details can be phrased as questions, some as actions, some as thoughts, sights, sounds, feelings, objects, descriptions, examples, explanations. And finally, I teach kids about attributes. And this actually I put in a little STEM twist. I put in a little computer science twist. And I point out that every object, everything we can see has an attribute. For example, one of the attributes might be color. So if you looked at my shirt, and if you can see it, you'll see it's red. So the shirt has an attribute, and the attribute is red. But it's also a special kind of shirt. And the kids would probably say, it's a T-shirt. OK, so now Mr. Piha is wearing a red T-shirt. All of a sudden, we've got some detail there. How have I gotten it? With attributes. And I'll tell you, basically, you have almost infinite number of attributes for anything. What do you think my T-shirt's made out of? Most are made of cotton. OK, this one's cotton. What do you think the size is? Well, Mr. Piha is a little overweight, so it's probably an extra large. OK, attributes, attributes, attributes. So all of these categories can uh, spur kids to get details. And then attributes is a category of categories. It just opens up a whole other world of details. So I could teach each of these lessons one per day, and they would work. But usually when I'm starting off with a class, I'll probably give them a couple of days to get the hang of it. But think about it now. We're maybe in the fourth or fifth or sixth week of class, and the kids have a huge vocabulary of skills and fixed behaviors now that um, rarely do writers ever get in their lives. And I can do this with kindergarten, and I can do it with 12th graders, I can do it with college kids, I can do it with adults. It's not ability bound, because basically all we're doing is using sets of behaviors here. Even revising for details is just getting kids to do a specific behavior. Um, we'll get to quality a little later in the year when I have a better sense on the, the skills the kids have. So let's go to the next one, see if I put another in there. All right, hey, we're already to the end here. It's uh, about five minutes to nine, so we're right on time. Here's the big discussion. And um, I want you to take this seriously, because I'll do my part if you'll do yours. If you started the year with a revision focus and you taught one or two revision strategies a week, your kids would know that revision is a part of writing and have a repertoire of 50 revision techniques. Now, if I gave you all 50 revision techniques, would you teach them? Ask the question. And, and this is not a rhetorical question, and I don't ask it lightly, because I know that it requires a lot of openness to take on a half year of teaching writing with faith that something as preposterous as this would actually work. Could you even imagine that in a single year, a class of fourth or fifth graders could learn 50 ways to revise their writing? It's possible. They may not remember them all. Not every kid will learn every one, but it's possible. And Mitch, that's kind of my ending point tonight, and that's the last bit of discussion. I'd love to have people chat with me, um, pop something in the IM window, and um, remember that you will all get some follow-up materials from me. Um, and uh, Judy hey, says, you know yes, what of course. It seems mm -hmm. possible with short pieces. That's good. Okay. 
Go ahead, Mitch. You know what Sorry. would be re really interesting is if um, some of the people here who have video cameras, if they have a, um, a, a, a type of writing or a type of kid that's giving them a problem or um, a technique that they want to talk about, if they, if they would click on the raise hand button, I can bring them up and they can ask the question to you on video. Right. Yeah. I always so, call this, what do you do with the kid who questions? Right. So, um, so if you have video, um, and, uh, and, and you have a question that you'd like to ask, uh, Somebody click on that it. raise I've hand. Actually, I've actually never seen this done in here. I'm dying to see oh. how it works. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, so what I, I, I see Patrick has video. Patrick's um, awesome. Kind of, so, um, Patrick, uh, I'm hoping that this is okay. I'm going to I'm going to bring myself down and I'm going to bring you up. So, <laughs> one second. <laughs> Sorry, Patrick. To Shindig. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Hi Patrick, how are you? What do you do with the kid that just continues to say I have it done? Why do I need to do it again? Okay. Um, there's a very simple response. Every time a kid refuses to perform an action of any kind, any kind, I simply say there is a rule. Mr. Piha's number one rule is do what I say the first time I tell you to do it. Now, I treat every form of non-participation exactly the same. It's non-participation. It is not allowed. Now, where I go from here depends on what I've worked out with my teaching partners, my administrator, or whatever. But essentially what happens is this. I will have these little showdowns, these mini showdowns with kids who are obstinate for whatever reason. And what's interesting is I don't care. I once had a kid elect, a 15-year-old guy, six feet tall, elected on his own to go take himself to the vice principal because he did not want to tie his shoes. I said, sir, I need you to tie your shoes so that you can sit up and watch class. He said, just a minute, man, I gotta tie my shoes. And of course he had these laces that were eight feet long and it was taking him a lot, it would have taken him 30 minutes to tie his shoes. And I just said, sir, sir, I didn't, I didn't, I was guest teaching that day. And I said, okay, look, you have a choice. The choice is stop tying your shoes, start playing along the game, or go to see, who's your counselor? Oh, Ms. Wilson? Okay, up, out, over, go. So he decides actually to get up and go to see his counselor. Ten minutes later, this large woman bangs on the door. She opens up and she said, Mr. Piha, not in my 27 years have I ever heard this. Is it true that this gentleman told you he wanted to come see me? And I said, tell her. And he said he does. That happens every time. At some point, the obstinacy breaks down. The kid gets to stay and do nothing, which is boredom, right? Kid can always say, I'm just going to put my head down. And I say, great, here are the rules. The only thing you can do is breathe. No movement allowed. Your other opportunity is to, sometimes I'll have a place outside of the room. Sometimes I'll have a place in the room. So there are different places. Sometimes I'll work with you so that you have a spot for one of my kids and I have a spot for one of your kids. But the point is to not incentivize that. To just have, I call it a, a cascade effect, basically. It's like there's always the next place the kid can go and the next place the kid can go. What's happening, though, is the kid is making the choice every time. All I'm doing is framing it. And there are only two choices. Do what I say you should do or go to the next level of not doing something. And I know that sounds simplistic, but if you follow it through in your mind to its logical end, you'll see that what will happen is kids realize that it's a lot more fun to stay in class and do what Mr. Piha says than it is to actually do nothing. Boredom is, is the biggest enemy for, for school age kids, unless they've learned to meditate or something. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Does that, does that give you what you need, or at least a, a place to start? Absolutely. Great. Wonderful. It's hard to do. Uh, I've had to practice it a lot over the years. And the one thing I have to make sure I do is I can never get upset. I just have to go, that's the rule. Yeah. 
Well, that, 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 that was cool. And, um, you know, I'd like to encourage people, uh, if you come to the, the future, to uh, raise your hand because I, I, I think that everybody gets a lot out of it when uh, the participants come here and, and, and they ask you questions like that directly. I, I, I like thought that was, a, that was a great question. Thank you, Patrick. So, uh, so it's uh, it's just after the hour. So um, and I guess it, it we're you're up in in about a month, right? In a, beginning of April yes. is your next session, mm -hmm. and so uh, hope to see everybody here then. And you're going to be emailing people. Uh, we're going to be having yeah. the archive here. We'll. Uh, We'll post it up on our website, and uh, you may email it out also. After each one of these, I have a list now of 168 people, or however many we have, and I send you out. Thank you, Michelle. That's very kind of you. Thank you, Valerie. Um, I send out a follow-up email a few days to a week later. Uh, again, I'm right into book production, so I might mm -hmm. be more into next week. And I send you everything for all the previous uh, webinars and uh, usually a note uh, about this webinar and something I've thought about since then, along with some links to materials. Uh, you're also all welcome to come to my site at www.ttms.org. It's a little shabby right now, but it's got a lot of free packets you can download. And I promise yeah. in another month, it will look beautiful. Well, a lot of good information. Thanks. So, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for appearing. I, I, I learned something. I really had a lot of fun revising my, my piece. I'm going to uh, apply that to a few. student, man. I'm oh. signing you up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. And, um, well, I'll talk to you before the, end, before the month, but I'll see you online in, in just, just under a month. Terrific. Thanks a lot, okay. everybody. Right, bye. Thank you thank very you, everybody. much, Judy. That was very kind of you. Bye. Okay, bye everybody. Thanks. This is Mitch Weisberg from EdChat Interactive signing off for the evening.